let's get going. So if you want to join our database, um, please just follow that link if you can get it and then go and fill in the little. So the what I'm talking about today is water reticulation and it's hot and cold water supply. So nothing to do with drainage, only supply piping. And just to quickly uh, go over, we will quickly fly through what I spoke about last week. If our units working out volume, static pressure, velocity, flow rate, difference between dynamic and flow pressure. And the, the, we start with those because it's important to grasp those concepts before you get to working out the pipe size. Then I'm going to very quickly skim over pipes. You guys are all plumbers, so I probably can't tell you much there. There's just one or two key things to point out. Then I will do one example um, where we work out a theoretical pipe sizing to total flow in a system. And that's as far as I'll go today. And then next week we will go to getting to probable flow and that type of thing. So starting off, remember that SI units are, uh, it's the metric system, but it's the, it's the key unit in each measure that we need to use. So for example, with length, when you're working in equations or formula, you need to work in meters, not centimeters or millimeters or kilometers. You've got to stick to that. Otherwise, your formula is going to be the wrong decimal point or where time's involved, it'll be completely wrong because you'll be dividing by 60 instead of one if it's minutes instead of seconds. So without spending too much time on that in plumbing, these are the measures we'd encounter. Mass, time, volume, velocity, pressure, rate of flow and distance. And those are the SI units. Important one um, is that rate of flow is cubic meters per second, not liters per minute. We end up converting back to liters per minute a lot because that's what makes sense in plumbing. Same with pressure. It's, it's actually pascals, not kilopascals. But I mean, we're not measuring blood pressure. We're measuring water pressure. But that is the correct unit to use in the formula. Okay. So... I, I really am not going to go to a great length about this, but working out the volume in, in a pipe, you would take the inside diameter and use that to, to apply pi r squared. So the radius times pi times the length of pipe, and that will give you the volume of water in that pipe. So in, in that example there, two meters of, of one inch ID pipe, um, you could see that we end up with just short of a liter in there, 0 0.982 liters. When we do the equation, you see the answer is 0.0009821 cubic meters, which looks doesn't make sense to anyone. But that's how we had to do it in the equation. And then you times it by 1,000, 1,000 liters in a cubic meter to get it back to liters. All right. Pressure, uh, once again, uh, and anybody that wants to spend time afterwards or you know, in another session, we can really go through these things at length. But... The key thing that we want to get out of this one uh, is that the height of a column of water, if you multiply that by 10, it would give you the pressure. So if you had a 55 meter high column of water, you would have a static pressure at the bottom of that column of 50 kPa. It makes be a bit less, but it's the height times gravity. Gravity is 9.81, close enough to 10. So that's the rule of thumb. On the right hand side, there's the two ways that you can get it either by working pressure as a ratio of force over area or times in the, the density by gravity by the height of water. We know water's got a density of one. But for us as plumbers for now, static pressure. In other words, water not moving. It's the height of the column times 10. Okay. To work out velocity, and velocity is a concept that we don't directly work with all the time other than being told it must be designed to 2.5 or 2 meters per second. But what is it really? You can work out when you've got pressure, how fast the water will come out at the uh, at the bottom of that or at that outlet of a tank or a pipe or wherever it is. Once you know the velocity and the volume, you can then work out the rate of flow. So you can't get a direct answer from, I've got X amount of pressure, what will my flow rate be? You need to work out the velocity and then you can get and the, the rule we use to do that is called Torricelli's law. And it's really quite simple. You can see it there. You, you take the square root of two times gravity times the height of the column. So in that example, you've got a five meter column. So the outlet is five meters below the top of the water. 
times it by gravity times it by 2 gives you 89.1 and the square root of that is 9.9 .9. so your water out of the five meter high column can come out of there at 10 meters per second so it's fast especially if you think that we designed to 2.5 meters per second um, but that's that's the equation used to work out velocity and then rate of flow is obviously the volume over time and as i said earlier if you know the volume of water in a pipe and you know how fast it's traveling so let's say it's going at 2.5 meters per second as as i've done in the example here and the volume of that pipe is 0.001 uh, 0.11 uh, cubic meters we would then have a flow rate you can see that I've, I've timed, uh, timed the volume by the velocity of 2.5. went up with a flow rate of 0 0.009508 cubic meters per second. And when you convert it back to liters per minute, it will give you a flow rate of 57 liters per minute out of a, out of a three quarter pipe, 22 pipe. Okay, and that's roughly right. So if the water's going as, uh, at the 2.5 meters per second design velocity, you'd get roughly 60 liters a minute out of that three quarter pipe. Okay, um, I just want to keep an eye on the time always. Um, the difference between specific, uh, potential and uh, poten sorry, man, static pressure and um, dynamic pressure is that static pressure is when nothing's happening. So it's, it's purely a measure of potential energy. That's how much that's how much energy is waiting to happen. Once the water starts moving, you then have dynamic pressure. So I've tried to illustrate it in that little picture. And as plumbers, we are really more concerned with with uh, dynamic pressure because the thing people are going to moan about is that their showers are, are miserable or the toilet doesn't flush or the water is not getting to the bottom tap or whatever it is. So we're really concerned with flow rate. That's the ultimate thing that we we calculating towards but obviously pressure friction all those things come into it before we get to the actual flow rate okay so if you think of static pressure as when nothing's happening and dynamic pressure once it's moving in the pipe and it's subject to all these other parameters friction and so on i won't do these questions today but if you go back to the um if you go back to the presentation those are nice little easy sums to work out to try for yourself. And then on the next slide, I give the answer. So test yourself if you understood of the three concepts that I've kind of given you now. How to work out volume, how to work out velocity, and how to work out rate of flow. Okay, so why do we need different pipe sizes? Why can't we just put one pipe and get finished with it? And, you know, so. If you've got large demand for water, so you've got a massive big commercial building or a stadium or even a golf club uh, ablution block or something, you obviously need bigger pipes to get more water into that system. Just like if you've got a big town, you need big roads to get the cars in and out. If you've got a little village, you can go there with a little goat track. So we definitely need to... Um, in a house, we might get away with saying, oh, let's take half inch to everything, it'll probably work. But when you get to commercial buildings and bigger projects, even big houses or long runs, you need to be uh, you need to be a little bit more scientific about the pipe sizing. So on pipes, you you guys know all about pipes. The the main point I wanted to make is different types of pipe are named by different things. So like copper pipe, for example, when you talk about twenty two mil copper pipe, it's the outside diameter. When you talk about three quarter galvanized pipe, it's inside diameter. So you've, you've got a little table there, but what we're really concerned with is the inside diameter, not the nominal diameter or the outside, it's the inside diameter because that's where the water flows. And uh, so just be careful to make sure, you know, in the old days, if you did a three quarter copper pipe, it was fine for a flash master, but if you used a three-quarter polycop, it wasn't fine because the wall thickness made the internal bore that little bit smaller and the critical flow wasn't achieved. 
So just make sure if you're sizing it that you work to the internal diameter that you know your pipes. Um, there are very, very many pipes. You guys all over the country will know that these days there are any number of different piping systems that guys use. And so once again, I'll just reiterate, remember to look at the internal diameter when you when it's critical. Okay, I really won't go through that. As plumbers, you know how to connect all the different types of pipe. And as I said, there's a table with the name and the actual calculated diameter inside. Bed sizes as well. My this training I used also for uh, sales guys so that they just got a grasp of it, but it was uh, it's not really relevant for this talk, so I'm going to skim over that. Same thing here. Yeah, guys couldn't understand why you've got a copper pipe fitting, but you talk about male and female line. We know what that's about. Okay, so before um, starting to do a pipe design, there's a few things that we would need to know. So from the site. Um, you would need to know, first of all, what type of building it is, because that's going to affect which tables you read the flow from, what the pressure is on site, uh, how far your longest run, run is, and how high the draw off point is going to be. So those are all things which we would call in the primary part of the calculation. And then when you get down to the segments, you've got to, either as a, as a specialist, you've got to dictate what these things will be, or if there's a wet services engineer or developer and architect who's going to tell us as plumbers what to do, we need to know, first of all, that that everything's in compliance with the regulations, obviously. We are P plumbers, we do things properly. Uh, so we then need to know what type of pipe we're going to use. Are there going to be tanks? Is there a requirement for storage? Um, what type of water heating system we're using is it going to be a heat pump, electric geysers, boilers, and then uh, critically on flashing, are they systems, concealed systems, flash masters, those things can dramatically affect pipe size, and uh, your choice of terminal fittings, which, um, yeah, it's not terribly critical which type of basin mix or sink mix, but if you start to use things like metering valves or thermostat control things, obviously we've got a design for it. And then last, uh, are you including the fire reticulation or is that a two-pipe system being done separately? So we, before we even start, we need to know those things. Okay, so uh, this was the part of the talk that I wanted to spend a little bit more time on. So we've got sort of half of the time left. And um, the example, the next example I do is not going to worry about water temperature, any of that stuff. It's just to establish, once you know how much water you need to supply, how do we work out what size pipe? Okay, the how much water we need to supply in the next week's talk I'm going to get into because if you've got 10 toilets, it doesn't mean they're all going to flush at the same time. So you, you have what's called a probable flow, but I'm not going to deal with that today. I'm going to deal with total flow just so that you get the, the concept of the theory. Okay, so, excuse me, in this little example, I've, I've said we've got, uh, well, there's 16 of these things, 16 shower roses, okay, they all, uh, they all need 150 kPa flow pressure to work, okay, they don't really, but for the example, that's what we say, they're all going to flow 15 liters per minute, um, they're all going to be used at the same time, We've got a starting pressure of 400 kPa, and we're going to be using copper pipe. Okay, so that's hypothetical. That's not what it'll really be. But if that's the amount of water we need to these things, then that's how we start taking the design. And and again, you see that I use liters per minute, which is not an SI unit, so it sounds like I'm contradicting myself. But once you've got to the unit that you, you need or familiar with, um, we end up back in liters per minute because the load unit tables are in liters per minute. But to do the calculation from from the first rudiments, physics, uh, pressure, uh, volume, and so on, at, at that point you must get back into SI units. Okay, so you got all of that. So um, the first thing we would do is uh, on our little diagram you label each segment. So every time there's a change, 
you you label it. And the change, uh, if there's a change in direction, it's not really critical. But um, if there's a change in either the amount of things that are being fed or the draw or height, then you change the label. So segment A is feeding all, oh, I've gone forward there, sorry. It's feeding all of that stuff, okay? Segment B is still feeding all of that stuff, but it's changed in height. It's lost five meters of head, okay? Segment C is only feeding this branch, okay? So that's how you keep changing the, the segment label. And you need to do it, even if you're using the SABS tables and so on, uh, because you need to know what each little segment, how much water it needs. So now we've labeled the pipe segments. You then go, and remember I spoke about this primary information you need, okay? So we need to know the available pressure, how much height or how much water head we're going to lose, what the required pressure is, and then the permissible loss would be, the, that would be the um, product of dividing the, the total loss by, I'll show it to you now, no? by the distance to the critical point. Then we know how many kPa per meter we can lose. So just to populate that, the available pressure, remember we were told we're going to have 400 kPa. The loss of head is that height. The highest point is 8 meters above the dwarf point. Okay. We said that we needed 150 kPa. That was the required pressure. And the distance to the critical point was the furthest and the highest. And we got it by obviously counting up the meters to that point there. So there we have that information. And once we've got that information in here, we're able to work out that we, we've got 170 kPa that we can afford to lose once we've looked after everything, the height and the required pressure. We've got a distance of 45 meters to that point, which means every meter we can afford to lose 3.8 kPa. Okay? And at the, the, the velocity, we didn't work that out because it's a given. We've been told this must be done to say it's 0252, and it must be designed to 2.5 meters per second velocity. Okay, we can't really control the velocity. I told you that pressure would. So if you let this thing really fly open out of an open pipe, you're going to get a whole lot more than that. But we can design it to make sure that at that flow, the water will now only travel no faster than 2.5 meters per second. And that's quiet, well, quietish. Uh, it doesn't cause cavitation and uh, it's, a, it's deemed to be a good design velocity. Okay, so now you would start with the segments. Okay, so remember we labeled all these segments, so you've got to put them in a, a little table. Let's keep an eye on the time. And you, what you need to know from each segment is how long it is and what all it's feeding so that we can get to the required flow for that segment. So if you take segment A, it's 20 meters long, it's feeding all of those showers, 16 of them. And remember, we said they need 15 liters per minute each. So that's got to supply a total flow of 240 liters per minute. Okay. In real life, it wouldn't, because they wouldn't all be going at the same time. And But for the example, so 240 liters per minute we need. We need a pipe that can supply that much water when the water is not going faster than two and a half meters per second. Okay. So now... Okay, so, so I hope everybody's got that, and you do the same for each and every segment. Okay, now we go to these, uh, and in this case, I'm using the SABS charts. There are many like this. I think every pipe manufacturer puts out flow curves like this, um, and there are lots of different approaches, but this is the one you guys have probably mostly seen. And now, uh, if you're used to using it, I apologize, but if you don't and you looked at it for the first time like me and thought yes like dude what is going on here that's what i wanted to just quickly show you so the dotted line uh, is the flow uh, it's the curve okay it's the flow curve at the given velocity and it doesn't look like a curve so the curve comes from the way that these uh, rates of flow are spaced so you see that those are not evenly spaced and if those were evenly spaced, these would become a curve. So how do we use this damn thing? Okay, so we take this, um, I just want to move my little thing is blocking my screen. Okay, so we take 
sorry guys, but my um, Zoom meeting's blocking the thing I'm trying to read. All right, so take that table of required flow per segment, and off we go. So for segment A, we need 240 liters per minute. You go and find that down here on the on the flow rate. See, there's the flow rate. That seems to be around about 240 liters per minute. We then go and look for the 2.5 meter velocity curve. There it is. Okay, so it's that curve over there. Remember that it's a straight line when we look at it, but it's actually a curve. Um, and then you, so there's, there it is. You then go and match the, the point where this flow rate crosses that curve. Okay. And at that point, you would then go and see which, which pipe size have we got. So we've ended up with a 54 millimeter pipe. Okay, now we all know that's ridiculous for some showers, but remember we said they're all going to flow and they're all going to go at 2.5 meters per second. Okay, so you, you, the, the next thing you, you now check, so, so according to uh, just pure flow rate and velocity, we've ended up with a, with a 54 millimeter pipe. Next thing you want to check is that you haven't lost more friction than you're allowed to. You're only allowed to lose 3.8 kPa per meter. Okay, so now you go across to this side of the table and you look at what your friction loss is. And, and in life, people like to confuse us. So we talk about losing kPa per meter. And then on the table here, these guys talk about meters per meter. Okay, so why do they do that? Even knows, but a meter per meter. How many kPa is a one meter head of water? It's 10 kPa. Remember we said it's gravity times the height would be. So when, if you talk about losing meters per meter, times about 10, it'll tell you how many kPa per meter. So at that point, we can see we're losing somewhere between one and two kPa per meter. Okay, if you times 0 0.1 by 10, it gives you one and 0 0.2 gives you. So we're losing, let's say 1.2 kPa per meter. How much are we allowed to lose? Okay, I told you that whole story there. <laughs> we are allowed to lose 3.8. We're only losing 1.2, so we're all good to go. So it now tells us that we have accommodated both velocity and friction loss with a 54 mil pipe. Okay, and then you, um, yeah, so there are, I just made that there, so there are other tables that might be easier to read. So you then, um, yeah, I've given the example here. I'm not going to go through that because of time, but it's it's the same thing. You go and find your flow, check it that way, make sure it covers both. There's also um, computerized systems. We then go back to the drawing, and we do the same thing uh, for each and every segment. So you can see where we need 240, we end up with a 54. And so you go down um, until when you need 15, you, you only end up with a, a little half inch pipe. And then you would go and take this information and populate it back onto your drawing. There, and we'll do it next week to get to, get to a real example. But um, as plumbers, uh, we know that answer is correct. It covers all this science and the theory, but it would be ridiculous to have a 35 pipe, push it down to 28, then to 22, then to 15. We would rather not go 35 all the way to the end if, if we needed to. But um, it's, a, it's to show you how to get there. So in, in real life, we would, um, we would do, get into probable flow requirement, and that's what I'll cover next week. So I have said this earlier as well. Why why do I tell you to work in SI units and then you see liters per minute all over the place? It's critical in the formula and the calculations when we're using the, the rudimentary values, the volume, flow, pressure, then work in SI units. Once you've got the results, let's say in cubic meters per second, then convert it back to something you know. So I think that... Um, that is as far as I'm going to go today. I know it's been a rush through, but it's uh, 
And if you take the time to to work through it yourself, um, I hope it will be of value. I would also really appreciate some feedback if it's too technical or if it's too rushed or if it's stuff that's really too basic. And uh, yeah, next week we're going to pick it up from from probable demand. So thanks very much for the listening. Um, and remember to take the uh, the survey as well, if you could please.